You probably asked yourself this last week, what is happening in our nation? Well, it's a great question because the truth is, is we look around and what do we see? And, and we really see a couple of different things. We see uh, social decay. And what do I mean by social decay is this, a decline in art and entertainment. Let's look at our art and entertainment for just a moment. Just think about when I was a kid, Baywatch was edgy. Whenever I was a child, Baywatch, oh my gosh, people running around in one pieces on the beach and doing lifeguard stuff. And to me, as a little kid, that was, that was out there. That was something that you didn't see. That was the early 90s. And back then, that was, whew, you turn that on today and everybody's thinking you're watching a kid's show. It's that bad. You look at art anymore. Art is no longer art. Art is basically garbage when you really get down to it. Uh, in addition to that, you also see a loss of tradition. There's really, really not really tradition anymore. In fact, everything of the old way is attacked as being patriarchal or sexist, misogynist, all these different words that they use to describe anything of tradition. There's also a degradation of the young. A lot of people are not aware of this, but you can go on YouTube and you can look up so many different things. And there's a lot of programs on YouTube that are targeted toward children that are not children friendly. And so you have got this, uh, the, the, this loss of tradition, the degradation of the long, young. Uh, really what you find is it's general lawlessness. And it's basically, you can call this all social decay. Social decay. This lawlessness, the best examples you can think of, obviously just this last week, the events down in Florida. But if you go back even further, you go back all the way to, to a few years back, all the way over in St. Louis, all the events that took place there, the rioting, the, the just, think about this for just a moment. The city of St. Louis was under siege by a riot because a guy went and robbed a store. And they thought that it wasn't right, that what took place afterward wasn't right, that he then assaulted a police officer. Think about that. That is lawlessness. And that is a sign of social decay. The next thing we see is a cultural decay. Uh, decline of education is a key paramount thing. It used to be back whenever... Uh, I guess I, I've seen tests from 100 years ago, and those tests, there's no way I could pass. And I think to myself, I'm, I'm a fairly smart guy. I study a lot. I like learning. I couldn't pass those tests. I remember hearing a statistic one time whenever the presidents of, say, 100 plus years ago would speak, you had to have a college education or better to understand what they were talking about. And today, anyone can understand, which is fine, but yet to have a, a, an education that's basically kind of comes down to everyone instead of trying to propel all of us up to above. A general decline in education because the truth is that you can no longer teach civics in our schools. Instead, you teach other things. Just look at the degree programs that are out there now. I love Mike Rowe. He talks about real jobs and how you can go out and you can get a real job and actually earn real money to provide for your, your family and for your loved ones. But yet, meanwhile, in colleges, we send our children off to colleges, which is little more than indoctrination camps, to teach and learn things that really, when they get out, all they have is just a big pile of debt and degree that's about as <laughs> worth as much as the paper it's printed on. Education is destroyed. We have a weakening of the cultural foundations. We have materialism out the wazoo. People, they, they worship things. And we have got a decadence. <clears throat> Decadence is a big word. I had to Google and look it up and see what it meant. Decadence is a, is a word basically it describes exactly that. Materialism chasing itself for its own pure enjoyment is one way to put that. So we see social decay. We see cultural decay. We also see moral decay, a rising immorality. If you don't see a rising immorality, once again, just cite last week in Florida, cite St. Louis with the riots. You also have got a decay of religious belief. Look at the church itself. The church isn't the same church it was 50 years ago. <sighs> I think about the different things I see within the church today, and I just think to myself, wow, the church is not the church it was when I was a little child. It's married itself to this present age. You also see a devaluing of life. The devaluation of life is so very sad because what you now see is even children who are still in the womb are just discarded as though it is nothing. It's terrible. It's terrifying when you really get down to it. These three things combine social decay, cultural decay, and moral decay. A, a Dr. Jim Nelson Black describes those three things all as this. A nation in decline. 
our culture is in fact in decline. And the thing is, is that a lot of people don't realize it. If you follow me, and I hate to say this because I, I hate talking even about Facebook because I really don't use it that much. If you ever follow me on Facebook, you'll come to realize that from time to time, maybe once every month, I'll often talk, discuss with people, I don't believe there is a political solution to the issues of our modern day because it's not a political problem. The truth is, is that the politics and all that aside, that's just sideshow traction. That's part of the entertainment that's gone wrong. The truth is, is that we are in fact in a declining society. But the difference is, we can look at that as one of two ways. We can either look at that as though it's just the grim will of life and the world around us continuing to spin, yet another civilization will be crushed under its wheel. Or we can look at it as an opportunity to begin to fight back against the wickedness of this dark age. Those are the two choices that lay out ahead of us. Because you see, the reality is this is really a nation that's in need. This is a culture that is in need. That's what's really taking place. And we ourselves, we have got to become strong-willed about what it takes to really fix the issues. You see, the reality is, is that we as Christians know how to fix it. We really do. We know how to fix it. But we must begin to make the argument, not just say it. So today what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about how is it we can begin to repair our society? How can we repair our culture? How can we go back and push back against everything that's happened over the last, to be quite honest, probably 100 years? This all started roughly about 100 years. As The best way to put it is like this. About 100 years back, if you think back, the church was very, very powerful in the United States. Very powerful. Most people would identify as being religious. Something began to creep in. In fact, it began to infiltrate into our colleges and universities in the 50s and 60s. McCarthyism was actually right, of all things. But the amazing thing is that we didn't see it coming. The reality is, is that we have got to push back against this age because this age is full of one thing, and that's this. I hate to pin it all on this one thing, but it's a part of the problem. Atheism. You see, atheism actually leads to nihilism. Nihilism, eventually, in fact, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, the man who is probably one of the most four leading thoughts on nihilism, eventually <coughs> went insane. That's the thing. Insanity breeds from that type of thought. So how do we fix? How do we fight back? We have the instructions right ahead of us. Matthew chapter 5, if you have your Bibles. Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to start reading at uh, verse 13. It says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, you put it on stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may go see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We will stop right there. A lot of people don't know this. A lot of people do not know this. But there is a Christian historian, whenever the Roman Empire finally fell after hundreds of years, he was asked in question as to why it fell. And he wrote very, very simply, because it deserved to. It deserved to. And whenever you begin to examine the Roman Empire, you realize something very, very quickly. United States of America is Roman Empire 2.0 is what we really are in a lot of ways. A lot of people haven't come to that realization. And whether we're actually Roman Republic, Roman Empire, you could debate that. But in a lot of ways, that's what we are. And the reality is, is that we are not quite to that edge where we deserve as a nation to fall because there are still good and godly people in this country. There are still good people who stand up for what's right because you see... In Rome, there eventually became a point where a field was worth less than a slave. And I don't mean just any slave. I mean a slave that had to be of a, uh, let, let me put this uh, with, with children. How is the best way to put this? Um, a slave who was somewhat attractive, I'll say that, was worth less than a field. A jar of caviar was worth more than a plowman to go out and actually produce food that could feed people. That's decadence. That's runaway materialism. That's a, a desire to want to have things. And part of the problem in the United States of America and part of the problem in the world at large is everyone has got this hole in their hearts. 
And this hole in our hearts, we sit there and we try to jam things into that hole to try to fill it. The problem is, it's a hole in our hearts that can't be filled by things. It has to be filled by relationships. And our relationship with our Lord, our Savior Christ, has got to be the paramount aspect of that. Because you see, God desires for us to be a part of the light and the salt of this world. We don't think about salt in the way they did back then. Salt was a preservative. Salt was a preservative. And they would use it to treat and cure meat. Today, whenever we think about preserving meat and foods, we think about our freezer or our fridge. We throw it in there and, and however long it lasts is, is how good we can keep it. But the reality is, is in their time period, they used salt to be able to cure the meat, to be able to protect it, provide it, to keep it going. What is it that we do today whenever a, a fridge goes bad? Well, you really have only two choices. You replace the fridge or you fix it. The problem is the church is basically that refrigerator. The church is the salt he's talking about here. We have two choices. We either fix the church or we replace the church. The reality is the church, I hate to say this, over the last 50 years, and I'm a little bit of a tinfoil hat kind of guy. I really am. I will admit it. Over the last 50 years, I remember coming across an article that the church was actually targeted specifically by the CIA. It doesn't go into much detail. In fact, if I remember correctly, this is actually in the WikiLeaks over the last 5, 10 years. The church in the United States was actually targeted by the government. Why? Why would the church be targeted by the government? Insane. Is there not such a thing as a separation of, of, of powers, separation of church and state even? Obviously, it only goes one direction. But it's not supposed to be that way. The greater problem is that we have got to begin to recognize and realize that we've got to get back to the beginning of what all started. The very foundations of the church itself. Because upon the foundation that he built is where we know that we can, in fact, begin to push back and change this nation. We have got work to do. Our work is not preserving the culture. Because the thing is, this culture, let's be honest, we all don't like it anyways. We turn on the TV and most of us probably see the things that they call entertainment today and we all kind of get a little sick to our stomach and turn a channel. Let's be honest, that's what we all probably do. Or you're like me, you don't even watch television anymore. We're already all there. So let's just throw that out and realize that we, we've already gotten past that point. Or if we're not, we're kind of on that, that fence right there. But the truth is we're not trying to save that culture. What we're really trying to save is we're trying to save one another. And how do we do that? By preserving our faith. Preserving our faith. And not the fake faith that they're trying to push off on people. One of the problems with the church is it's become commercialized. I have a brother over in Kansas City, and, and the amazing thing about my brother, I love him to death. He goes to churches, he tries to fit in, he tries to go and do things. And the first thing is, he walks into a church and they, they start talking about, hey, we need, we need more money to build this, we need more money to do this. And all the entire message is all about how we need more money to do everything. They're not talking about principles of building up people and finding God. They're talking about how their church needs to be larger. When I was going to Bible college many, many years ago, and this is one of the things that, that angered me so much in Bible college, I was at this church one day, and I was sitting looking through their bulletin. On the back side of their bulletin, they had written very, very plainly their, their funding for the year. They had invested over $5,000 into a stereo speaker system. Now, mind you, this is back in the 90s. $5,000 in stereo system equipment back then would have been quite a lot. And as I kept reading and I came down, I found their missions output, 500 bucks. And I'm thinking to myself, you guys don't get it. You've got this beautiful, wonderful facility already. Yeah, I get that you have to have speakers for people to be able to hear you because it's such a large auditorium, but you're not getting the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is people. It's not a business. It's not a business. Now, does that mean that preachers who are on television and things like that are bad? No. It, it, maybe it means they need to adjust themselves. Because you can still be led to Christ through those things. But those people need to be adjusted make sure that they're actually biblically based. Biblically based. It says here, You are a light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it up on the stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I've always loved the example of a man sitting inside of a, uh, a room with no light on. He's eating a bowl of chili. 
and he's sitting there just eating that chili. And of course, he's got a white shirt on. He's sitting there in the, in the darkness, eating his bowl of chili. Next thing you know, on comes a light, and you see his entire shirt's just been covered in chili. And the fact of the matter is, is that we're all kind of there. We've all done that. I, to be honest, I could do it with the light on. The amazing thing about it is, though, we, the church, we need to be that light in this dark age. We need to give hope. We need to give direction. Now, giving direction to people, a lot of people don't like to hear it. But the truth is, is that we need to talk about facts anymore. We've got work to do as a church. We've got work to do. We need to first off look at the church itself, make sure it's biblical. If it's not on the Bible, it's not the church. That's all there is to it. Secondly, we need to begin to try to give light to others to help to lead them on the path. Because I tell you what, what this world needs more than anything else is more light. There's more than enough darkness to go around. We need more light. Let's read on. Verse 17 says, Do you not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets? I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And we will stop right there. A lot of people miss the point of the Old Testament, the law, whenever it's saying thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. The reality is, is that the New Testament didn't come to abolish the law. It came to complete it. You see, the Apostle Paul tells us the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is to point out the need of salvation, the need of a Savior, the need of Christ Himself. That's what the law does. That's what it came for, is to show us that we need help. And you see, as we're walking in this light, we're going to see things that are of the dark side. We are going to see those things, and we'll be able to look at them. And we may even identify those things in ourselves. And we've got to begin to, to, to recognize that we've got a fight even within ourselves. Because the truth is, the way Christianity views the world is like this. We were once pure and walking with Christ in the garden. One day we were deceived, and we fell into darkness. That darkness is in us, whether we want it there or not. But the thing is, God had a plan despite all that. Even though we may want to walk in the darkness, even though we may feel the need to, we still have the light. And we still have got the ability to reach out and grab a hold of that light for all that it is. And that light is Christ. For you see, the reality is, we're supposed to be with God. We're supposed to be walking with Him in the cool of the day in the garden, sharing with Him, talking with Him and having that kind of a life and relationship with Him. That's where we are to be. But the sad fact of the matter, it's not where we are. The culture around us, it would point toward all the dark things as being good and would say the light is, in fact, restrictive, harmful, judgmental. The truth is, is that we... We're not the ones walking in darkness. We're not the ones lost. Many years ago, me and two or three of my friends were out camping. We were out not too far off of 180, Route 128 out here between Santa and Altamont. We were down in these woods. A good buddy of mine knew the back of these woods like the back side of his hand. And three hours later, we still hadn't found where we'd parked. <laughs> the bad thing is, the only one of us that had any common sense to bring anything such as a flashlight or headlamp was myself and mine was a piece of junk and kept falling apart every time I took a step. We were trying to find our way out of this forest. We could hear the traffic on Route 128. We knew it wasn't that far away, but we knew that's not the direction we needed to go. And the bad thing is we just could not find our way out. There was way too many briars and everything else hanging us up. And that's the truth about this world. There's too many briars. There's too many things hanging us up. You can maybe hear the direction and know the direction you need, but you need help sometimes. And that's where we come in, to be that salt, to be that light, to help people out of that darkness. For you see, that darkness is frightening. I was terrified to death. I was going to get eaten by a bear that night. I thought coyotes were going to come up and just tear me up. Oh, Lord, I was terrified. But I was just a little kid then. I shouldn't have been out there in the woods by myself in the first place, let alone with these 
guys that didn't know, know where the heck they were even at. And like I said, guy knew the woods like the back of his hand and had to really question how well he knew the back of his hand after that. <laughs> I was terrified. But you know, we eventually got out of it. The truth is, as we walk in this darkness, we do need help. Every one of us does. And because we all know that we all need help, as a result of that, we can correct others politely. Not harmfully, not meanly, not in, in spite, but politely. Help to correct others, to help to guide them, to help them to get out of the darkness as well. That's what we're really called to do. One last point I want to make, and that's this. Verse 38, we're going to jump ahead a little bit. It says, you have heard it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them also the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you, take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to one who asked you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. There's a lot to that passage. But it really kind of goes hand in hand with verse 43. So let's keep going. It says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are you not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do you not even pagans do that? Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You see, the truth is, is as we learn more about this young man down in Florida, there's a lot of things about him that are very, very sad. If I understand correctly, he was adopted at a young age. We don't know all the circumstances of his prior to his adoption. We know he was on psychotropic drugs, which pretty much every mass shooter for the last probably 20 years has been on psychotropic drugs. It tells you a lot right there. We know there was a lot of other issues. And I, and I hate to think it, what if he had a little exposure to not, not just the idea of love, but actual real love? Because love sometimes is hard. There's such a thing as hard love, tough love. But I, I, I ask myself, what could have been different? And the answer is, love never does wrong. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And in the end, these three remain faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Perhaps maybe things would have been a little different. Perhaps the events would have not taken place. But perhaps, perhaps the next time, maybe the love of family, the love of friends will make the impact in a person's heart to help to shatter that darkness so that they would not walk that dark path. In conclusion, as we go throughout this week, I want to share with you a, a very, very simple line from an old Garth Brooks song. And I'm going to mess up the quote because I haven't heard the song in probably 20 years. But the quote's very, very simple. I don't do this to change the world, but I do this so that the world does not change me. And that's a challenge each and every one of us has laid before us. We may not change the world, but we can make sure the world doesn't change us to be like that. Another thing I'd like to share with you is there's a quote from, uh, I, I wish I could remember the gentleman's name. He, he's a, a Catholic priest. He used to be on television many years ago, black and white TV, ages ago. Fulton Sheen, I believe is his name. He said something to the effect, and I'm, I'm going to butcher this also. The church that marries itself to this age will be widowed in the next. Our church we, begin to we need, be need to begin to stand for truth, for love, for faith, for tradition, for family, for loyalty, for respect. We need to begin to rise up and push back. Because the truth is, all the problems that are facing this world today, we have the solutions. They've already been given to us. And in the end, as civilizations become strong and powerful and rise and fall, all those things are secondary whenever you really get down to it. Because you see something. Rome was at the height of its power during the time of Christ. 400 years later, it had basically crumbled. The Greek Empire was at its height a couple hundred years before Christ. By the time of Christ, it had crumbled also. But the reality is, during all those things, Christ endures above all else. Because you see, 
being good to others, loving one another, caring about each other, those things are eternal. And they shall forever always be there eternally. If you would, our closing hymn is page 312. And please stand. <laughs>